If you were cursed to be stalked by an immortal killer for life, what would you do? It can look like anyone you know will never give up and nothing can break the curse. So I'm going to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to be the shape-shifting stalker in It Follows. <laughs> This young woman Jay's whole life is about to change. Soon she will have to go on the run from an inhuman killer who will hunt her for life. This girl runs out of her home in a quiet suburb. She seems terrified and keeps looking over her shoulder as she pauses in the middle of the street, but there's nothing there. The girl gets into a car and drives away, ignoring her ringing phone for hours and reaching a nearby beach by nightfall. She sits on the sand crying, finally answering her father's calls. The woman tells him that she loves him and says goodbye as she stares at the empty beach in front of her. The next Next morning, she lays dead in the sand where something has badly mutilated her body. Sometime later, this young woman Jay here was on a movie date with her boyfriend Q. She tells the young man that she used to play a game where one of them picks someone in the crowd that they want to trade places with and their partner has to guess who they've picked. When it's Jay's turn to guess, her boyfriend points out that he wants to trade places with this little boy with his family because the boy still has his whole life ahead of him. Jay finds his answer a little strange but doesn't say anything to him. It's Hugh's turn to guess as they enter the theater and wait for the movie to start. He guesses that Jay wants to trade with a girl in a yellow dress standing by the entrance. Jay turns around to look but doesn't see anyone there even after Hugh points the girl out. This makes the young man very uncomfortable. His attitude instantly changes and he tells Jay that he doesn't feel well and begs her to leave the theater with him. He walks them back to the car acting nervous and looking behind them at the empty parking lot the whole time. The couple end up spending their night eating at a nearby diner instead. The next day, Jay tells her sister that her boy Boyfriend has been acting strangely. The sister asks if Jay has slept with him yet, and Jay says that she can tell he wants to, but she's not ready yet. That evening, Jay and the man go on another date. They choose a secluded beach this time where they kiss in the sand. The pair go back to his car where they continue kissing and end up sleeping together for the first time. Afterward, Jay stays in the car wondering out loud about her future and dreams in life. Suddenly, Hugh grabs her from behind, holding a rag soaked in chloroform over her face till she passes out. Now, before we get too far here, we wanted to quickly check in with some of our friends throughout the How to Beat video. If you want to look like the cool protagonist from your favorite horror movie, we suggest the official uniform of How to Beat video employees. These are the only shirts in the market specifically designed for signaling to the world you give great movie recommendations and are tailor-made for fending off the following. Serial killers, axe murderers, werewolves, death games of all shapes and sizes, fast zombies, slow zombies, medium fast zombies, sexy vampires, ugly vampires, giant spiders, goblins, ghouls, ghosts, and gremlins. Aside from their unique defensive properties, they also just look really cool. So whether you're a video store employee or just someone who wants the world to know you're having a damn good day, head on over to the link in the description and order your apparel today. Okay, it was clear from the start that Jay's boyfriend is up to no good. The guy is extremely shifty and won't tell his own girlfriend why he's acting like he has something to hide. Since they're still getting to know basic things about each other, it's obvious that Jay has only just started dating this man and doesn't know him that way. The fact that Hugh claims to have seen a girl in the cinema who isn't really there, then insists that Jay leave with him right after is a massive red flag. At best, the young man is changing the plans at the last minute and intends to trick Jay into going somewhere more private with them so they can get into them. This is very disrespectful as he knows that Jay just wants a regular movie date and will let him know if she's ready to take their relationship to the next level. Even worse, he might have spotted someone he's hiding from and wants to get away. Hugh's paranoia and constant looking around, even when there are no visible threats, is very similar to how a criminal on the run would act. Being that on edge about getting spotted at a crowded space in broad daylight is very different from getting nervous when walking through a dangerous place at night. In this case, it would not be a stretch to assume the guy's worried about getting spotted by the police, security guards, or even gang members he owes money to. Either way, this makes him both dishonest and untrustworthy. Jay should have realized that the guy's not being upfront with her and is likely involved in some very dangerous or illegal activities. This is not someone she should want to stay with. As a general practice, it's a great idea that an inexperienced young teenager like Jay meets new dates in a public space like the cinema while she figures out if she can trust them. If the young man turns out to be dangerous, he will be reluctant to try anything with so many witnesses around. Knowing this, Jay should never have agreed to leave the cinema with him, especially since Hugh could not give her a good reason to leave and she could not see the girl who caused him to get nervous. Jay should certainly not have agreed to go on another date to a more secluded location with someone like that. Since no one will be around at the quiet beach or in her boyfriend's car, no one will be able to help if he attacks her. At the minimum, Jay should carry some basic self-defense weapons with her at all times. Chloroform can take up to several minutes to completely knock someone out, and Hugh here has left one of her hands free. This means Jay actually has a small window to fight back here. If she was carrying pepper spray or a switchblade, she could injure the man and stun him for enough time to try and get away. 
Jay wakes up tied to a wheelchair on the second level of an abandoned building. Hugh appears and claims he did this for her own good, and that it's very important that she listens to what he has to say. He pushes Jay up to the edge of the building and shows her a naked woman approaching them from the ground floor. The young man explains that by sleeping together, he has passed on a curse to Jay. The naked woman is a supernatural entity that will now follow Jay for her life and try to kill her if it ever catches up. He tells Jay that she now needs to sleep with someone else as soon as she can to pass on the curse and protect herself. The entity will only go after the newest person in the line. Hughes says that if it ever manages to kill Jay, it will then start coming after him again. The entity enters the building and totally ignores the man as it continues walking towards Jay, who screams in terror. Before it can get to her, Hugh takes off running while pushing Jay in her wheelchair out of the building. He tells her that the entity is very slow, but it's not dumb. It will always know where Jay is and can figure out how to get around any complex obstacles she puts in its way. He takes her back to her house and dumps her on the pavement with her hands still tied up. Jay's sister and friends are playing cards on the porch and rush to help when they see Jay stumbling back onto her lawn. They call the police and a crowd of neighbors gather around the watch, bad-mouthing Jay's family as the police question Jay, then take her to the hospital. The police also examine the abandoned parking structure, where they only find the empty wheelchair her ex-boyfriend had used. Despite their investigation, they cannot find any traces of the young man or the entity, guessing that her ex used a fake identity to meet and connect with Jay. Sometime later, Jay is trying to put the incident behind her and returns to school. In the middle of a class, she looks out the window and sees an old woman in a hospital gown walking across the grass straight at her. No one else seems to notice as the teacher continues speaking about the lesson. Jay gets spooked and leaves the class. In the hallway, she sees the same woman continue to approach her. Jay calls out to the woman, which catches the attention of other students in the hallway. Now certain that this is the entity in another disguise, Jay scrambles out of the main doors and runs away. Okay, this is terrifying. If what Hughes says is true, this will be a deadly threat Jay will have to deal with for life. It's crucial that Jay finds out for herself how far the entity is bound to the physical world and its rules. The entity is extremely slow and doesn't get aggressive even while up close. This means that so long as Jay doesn't touch it, she's free to test how powerful it actually is. Using herself as bait, she should lure it into a room with two entrances. Once the entity enters the room, one of her friends can wait outside and lock the door behind it. Jay can then leave through the other entrance and lock the entity inside. While these simple locked doors are unlikely to hold the entity forever, observing how it tries to break out will at least give Jay an indication of its strength though, and any supernatural powers it may have. If her stalker can phase through walls or teleport, Jay should know now, so she's aware that she may not be as safe as she thinks she is when surrounded by four solid walls. If luck is on her side, and the entity is indeed confined by the laws of physics, her priority should then be to trap it forever. Planning ahead, Jay and her friends can set up a pit trap in a secluded part of the forest by digging a deep deep hole at least twice the height of an average man, then covering it up with a tarp and some foliage. Then, once again using herself as bait, Jay could trick it into falling into the pit. They can then fill the pit up with cement, trapping the entity forever once it hardens. He would be very useful in any plans they set up, since he's the only other person who can see the entity, and Jay will have absolutely no interest in him as long as Jay is alive. Jay should have realized this and demanded that he stay and help her. Even if he doesn't care about her well-being, the man will want Jay to survive as she's his shield from the entity. If she and Hugh can catch the entity in an open area, they can test how much physical punishment it can take or if it can be killed. Using a long spear or any kind of ranged weapon, he can inflict as much damage on its body as he can while it goes after Jay. Since the entity takes the form of human beings, it may have a physiology similar to regular people. This means that destroying its brain by shooting it in the head should kill it, or at least remove its capability of intelligent thought. Even if the entity is immortal, severing its brain from its central nervous system by cutting off its head will remove its ability to use its limbs to move forward in any direction. Jay goes to her sister and friends for help. She tells them she doesn't quite understand what is chasing her and is not willing to tell her mother or go to anyone else for help. This guy, Paul, is very worried about her. He offers to spend the night at her home sleeping on her couch to protect her, which Jay reluctantly accepts. That night, her friends stay over, but everything seems quiet at first. Jay goes to talk to Paul, and the two share a warm moment. It is clear Paul has feelings for Jay, but the young woman is unsure how she feels, and the two have never tried to date. They hear a crash from the kitchen, and Jay tells Paul to find out what happened, so the boy goes to check it out. He returns, telling Jay there's no one there, but that someone has smashed her kitchen window. Paul goes upstairs to wake Jay's sister up for help. Hearing no further sounds from the kitchen, Jay gets up and goes towards the room to see for herself. But this was her biggest mistake. The entity is right there. It's in the form of a hideously disheveled woman with urine running down her legs. It advances on Jay as she screams and flinches back. 
she runs upstairs and locks herself in a bedroom as she listens for signs the entity is still outside. Her friends hear the commotion and come to check on her. They knock on the door and try to reassure Jay that there's no one in the house, but the young woman is terrified. After a moment, she manages to get up and let Paul and her sister in. They're puzzled by what Jay saw and claim to not have seen anyone else in the kitchen. The young woman is beyond consolation and insists that something's after her. Just then, the doorknob starts to rattle from the outside and startles everyone. Calling out to demand who's there, they hear the voice of their other friend outside and decide to open the door to let her in. The girl stands harmlessly in the hallway, also confused by what is going on. Suddenly, Jay spots an inhumanly tall man emerge from behind the girl in the doorway. The young woman completely panics and rushes for the balcony screaming. They all call for Jay to slow down, but she doesn't listen. Fighting her bicycle, she rides away from the house alone at full speed as her neighbor watches on in curiosity. Okay, Jay here is being a complete moron. From her movie day with Hugh, she should have realized that the entity is invisible to people who aren't cursed, since she was not able to see the girl he was trying to point out. She has also learned for herself that the girls at her school could not see the entity when she called out to it in the hallway. This means that it was a terrible idea to only have Paul stay over to protect her, then send him to check the kitchen since she knows he can't see it and will report that there's no one there regardless. Instead, she should have prepared the house as a defensive weapon against the entity way in advance. The broken window is a massive clue that the entity has to work around physical barriers and needs to break into her house like a regular person. This means that Jay should have packed each room in the first story of her house with clutter, so the entity will have to take a long time walking around them or make a huge ruckus pushing them out of the way. Either way, this will buy her much more time to get away from the house if it attacks. Right now, Jay is the only one in her circle who can see it and hence defend against the entity. Her next focus should be on convincing her friends that the entity is real so they can throw their full time and resources sources behind helping her survive its attacks. The obvious solution would be to pull out her phone camera and record the entity as it slowly walks towards her. This is a long shot, and it's likely that if it cannot be seen by most people, it will not show up on camera either. Instead, she can keep recording but force the entity to interact with the objects around it. By pushing furniture in its way, she forces it to push them aside as it advances towards her. She can also throw flour from her kitchen onto the floor and angle her camera towards its legs so it can pick up its footprints. Once her friends see the environment moving on its own on camera, they will be convinced that Jay's telling the truth and be more willing to help her. If they are willing to risk their own lives to save her, the group can even agree to all inherit the curse by sleeping with each other one at a time. This will enable them to all see the entity and be able to properly defend against it. It would also solidify everyone's loyalty as it becomes literally a matter of their own life and death that they protect the person the entity is currently after. Jay ends up at a nearby park but can't figure out what to do next. She sits on a swing set in the middle of an open space and starts to rock back and forth. After a while, she hears a noise and spots some movement through the trees. The young woman tenses up and prepares to run for her life once again. Luckily, it's just her friends who have tracked her down. Jay hugs her sister in relief and starts to explain what happened. Jay spots someone else approaching and quickly asks her friends if they can all see it. They all say yes, meaning the figure is human. It turns out to be Jay's neighbor who saw Jay fleeing from the house and came to see what happened. The man, Greg, is around Jay's age. He offers to help after the friends explain that someone broke into Jay's house. Using his resources and connections, he manages to track down the address of Jay's ex-boyfriend sometime later. The whole group of friends drive down to a more rundown part of the suburbs to visit the address. There, they find an abandoned house. Jay's ex was living here, but he's long gone now. Going inside, they discover that every window has been covered up and that there are traps rigged to every entrance to the outside. The traps are tied to a chain of empty bottles and cans, which will rattle and cause a huge amount of noise if anything tries to enter the house. They also see a mattress in the attic. Beside it, they find a photo of the ex with a friend wearing a varsity jacket. Jay recognizes the high school the jacket is from. Jay and Greg go to the school, talk to a few people, and look through the yearbooks. They find out Jay's ex's real name. Now that they know who he is, the group tracks him down to his home. When his mother opens the door, Jay is stunned to see that she looks just like the naked woman the entity appeared as when it chased them at the abandoned building. The ex is surprised to see them, but doesn't hold back on giving them the information they have come for. He tells the friends that he inherited the curse from having a one-night stand with the woman he met at a bar, but has no idea where it came from or how to stop it. The young man explains that even if Jay can't see the entity at the moment, she can be sure it's walking straight at her all the time. Since it's slow, he suggests that she can drive a long distance away to buy herself some time, but it won't stop coming after her. Before they leave, he again tells Jay she needs to sleep with someone else to pass on the curse, so the entity will go after them instead. Okay, this is exactly what Jay needs to do now. 
In fact, she needs to set up methodical and frequent hookup sessions with a whole group of new partners in order to survive. Since the entity is very slow, each new person she adds to the chain can buy her many more weeks. Jay should borrow money from her friends and family and fly to the opposite side of the world right now. Australia, for example, can be an over 18 hour flight from the US and is an English speaking country where Jay can easily meet new people. Once in the new country, Jay should create profiles on every dating app she knows. In particular, she should set her preferences to swing so she can meet with people looking for constant companionship with different partners. The first group she can plan to meet with is a male female duo. She should do the date with the man, then watch him sleep with the woman to make sure the curse has been passed on twice in the same session. After that, she should invite the woman for another session with different partners as soon as possible and say that she just wants to watch the woman with the new man this time. Jay should then repeat this pattern and invite the new man to another session with brand new people a few days later. If she keeps on doing this with a group of three to four new swingers each time, she can add dozens of people from across the world to the chain in between her and the entity. Since she will be present as a voyeur at each session, she can personally watch to make sure that the curse is passed on efficiently up to two times each session. In particular, she can focus on people who travel often so the curse can be spread across the entire world. World. This means that the entity may have to take months walking onto planes, then across various states, while the people who have unknowingly been cursed add more and more or their partners to the line. If the curse spreads through dozens of other countries, that will buy Jay years more time before the entity goes after her again. It may seem cold to condemn this many people, but anything is better than letting it get Jay herself. And if the plan works, the curse will be passed on every few days anyway, so only a small handful of them will actually be caught by the entity. Jay should also make an effort to grow close to someone four or five people down from her in the curse chain. By constantly keeping tabs on this person, she will know if and when they are killed, so she knows when to restart the chain with a new group of people. Greg offers to take Jay and her friends to his parents' beach house. Thinking it's a great idea, they thank him and agree to go. When they get there, Jay sees that the house is beautiful and the beach is very private. They are far away from their neighborhood or anyone else. The next morning, Greg goes to a shed to take his parents' gun. He teaches Jay how to use it, making her practice by shooting at some cereal boxes. Later, Jay and her friends are resting on the beach. This girl Yara is a little behind and approaches the group from the road. Suddenly, Paul spots Yara floating by in the water. She yells to the group that the water is nice and that they should join her. The entity has disguised itself as Yara. It reaches Jay before anyone can realize something is wrong. The creature grabs Jay by the hair as the young woman screams for her life. Paul can't see the entity but swings a chair and throws Paul across the beach violently. The friends run into the nearby shed. Paul lifts his shirt and sees that the entity has scratched him badly across his stomach. The entity is close behind them. Jay grabs the gun and starts firing at it, hitting it in the neck and causing it to fall over. The entity gets up again and bangs on the door, smashing a hole in the wood. After a moment, it is Greg who appears through the hole. He can't see anything and is very confused about what's going on. Greg leaves to investigate and everything goes quiet. Jay inches closer to the door to look, but this was a huge mistake. The entity bursts through and starts to chase her again. Jay runs out of the shed and gets into her car. In a total panic, she drives off and leaves her friend behind. She speeds down the road and has to swerve to avoid another vehicle. The car careens into a field and crashes to a halt. Sometime later, Jay wakes up in the hospital. She hears sounds from the hallway and starts to tremble with fear as she thinks the entity is coming back, but there's nothing there. That night, Jay and Greg sleep together as the young man agrees to take on the curse. Sometime later, Jay asks Greg if he has seen the entity yet. The man claims to believe her, but says he doesn't think the entity is following him at all. After she's discharged, Jay returns home, but it's still guarded and paranoid. Greg tells her friends that the entity still hasn't appeared to him. Paul tries to tell him that something threw him across the beach, but Greg is convinced that Jay has got it wrong and that there's no entity following them. Okay, what Jay saw at the beach house is terrifying. She saw for herself that bullets do not hurt it. The entity was shot in the neck, likely rupturing its carotid artery. The fact that it manages to get up right after and have its wound disappear when it changes form shows that it either has the ability to heal rapidly or that its human form is just a facade and the entity is not restricted to the limits of human physiology at all. This makes it essentially unkillable. If that wasn't bad enough, the entity has also just shown how smart and cunning it can be by kicking a hole in the door, then leaving for over 45 seconds before returning to crawl through it. Jay now knows that it isn't predictable at all. Unlike what her ex told her, the entity doesn't just walk in a straight line towards its victims. It can change its route and behavior to be tactical and sneaking up on her. This means that the entity is fully capable of lulling her into a false sense of security. There are way too many new threats to prepare for since Jay has a number of places to frequents where the entity can be lying in wait for her. Knowing that the entity is intelligent and can think tactically also makes its ability to change its
its appearance far more deadly. By changing how it looks and behaves in ways that blend in seamlessly with the surroundings, it can easily catch Jay when she has her guard down. If it were me, this would change how I interact with other people entirely. I would keep a 10-foot distance from strangers at all times. This means no going out to crowded places and getting around exclusively by car rather than on foot or by public transport. I would have to depend on the people I love to bring me daily necessities. With my friends, I would demand they keep their distance too, unless they can tell me about a memory only they would know about. Once each of them has proven that they aren't the entity in disguise, I would give them all a secret password, a random and unique word like tangerine. Moving forward, they will need to say this password before coming within 10 feet of me. Even if someone approaches looking and acting just like my friend, I would treat them as dangerous unless they can tell me the password. The password can change weekly, with no one allowed to mention it unless they are coming to visit me. This prevents the entity from spying on any of the friends to learn information on how to approach and kill me. At night, Jay has locked herself in her room and forces herself to stay awake to look out the window. She spots a strange man dressed in white walk up to Greg's house. She bangs on her window, but the man ignores her. He tries to open Greg's front door, but finds it locked. So he smashes open a window with a rock and climbs into the house. Realizing that this is the entity coming to kill Greg, Jay tries to call him, but he doesn't pick up. She rushes across the street and climbs in through the broken window, hoping that she can warn Greg in time. She sees a woman pounding on his bedroom door and screams for him not to open it. Thinking it's his mother, Greg opens the door and the entity pounces on him immediately. Jay rushes to help, but it's too late. The man's face turns completely gray and he stops breathing. Knowing she's now in danger again, Jay gets back into her car and drives off as the entity emerges from the house and starts to walk towards her. The young woman drives aimlessly and bursts into tears. After getting a sufficient distance away, she spends the night sleeping on the hood of her car. The next morning, she walks to the beach and spots three men in a boat just off the shore. Jay strips down to her underwear and swims out to them, hoping to pass on the curse to buy herself more time. She returns home later that day. Paul comes by and offers to sleep with her so he can take on the curse and protect her. Jay turns him down, saying that she doesn't want him to get hurt after what happened to Greg. She regrets thinking that Greg could get away from the entity and wishes she had never gotten him killed. Paul is hurt that Jay doesn't want to sleep with him and tries to kiss her anyway. Jay turns him down again. Instead, he asks the young woman if she trusts him and urges him to think about the place where they first kissed. This happened at the local swimming pool. Jay's remaining friends gather in the car and start to head there. As they leave, Jay spots the entity on the roof watching her. Driving some distance to the edge of the suburbs, they park and continue on foot. The friends all have large bags with them, which is part of their plan to get rid of the entity once and for all. As they walk, they reminisce about how unfamiliar it feels to now be entering the city. The city is more run down, and their parents had always forbidden them from venturing out into the city, thinking it was dangerous. They continue ahead anyway, climbing a fence and entering the city's indoor swimming pool. Since it's so late, the place is closed and completely empty empty. Okay, if Jay here had tried harder and smarter to save Greg, the group could have one more strong member with them as they make their final stand against the entity. As soon as she slept with Greg, Jay should have realized that she's no longer in direct danger and all her resources need to be focused on protecting Greg. They now have an advantage they have never had before. More than one person can see the entity. When Jay sees it breaking into Greg's house, she should have realized that tracing its steps and entering through the window after it is always a losing move. In doing this, she's putting herself literally steps behind the entity at all times and will never make it to Greg first. Instead, she should have run around the house and gone directly to Greg's bedroom window. Then, picking up a rock similar to the one the entity used to break in, she could have thrown it through the man's window and yelled for him to climb out into the backyard. Greg may still be skeptical at exactly what is coming after them, but almost no one would choose to stay when a panicked friend comes to warn them that their life is in danger. Once Greg is a safe distance away, Jay can show him the entity and convince the man once and for all. Having Greg fully on Jay's side will be pivotal because the man has shown to be very resourceful and street smart. He has parents wealthy enough to own a beach house while being a charmer and possible drug dealer who has connections with many people in the town who can help. Having Greg on board would certainly be a huge asset for whatever they are planning to do at the swimming pool. Paul seems to have chosen the spot due to its sentimental value, not because it offers any tactical advantage. None of the friends know the building or even the city well, so they could easily get trapped inside with the entity. The building's back rooms are also narrow and maze-like, where just one locked door or wrong turn could lead to them being cornered by the entity. They should have realized that they needed to beat the entity on their own turf and keep to places they know like the back of their hand. That way escape routes can be planned out beforehand and pivotal choke points can be booby trapped to give Jay a fighting chance against the superhuman killer. At the very least,
least. Jay should not have entered the building with the others. Paul here should have scouted ahead, making sure that each room has multiple exits, and drawing a map of the building's layout so the group can stick together and make their way out quickly if things go wrong. The friends open their bags to reveal many household appliances and electronics. They plug them all in and place them all around the pool, right at the edge of the water. Jay changes into her swimsuit and gets into the pool, swimming out to the very middle. Their plan is to lure the entity into the pool, then pull Jay out the other side. Once the entity is in the pool on its own, they will throw all the appliances in and turn the pool into an electric death trap. The three friends wait at different ends of the pool, but everything remains quiet. They settle in for a couple of hours as they wait in silence for the entity to catch up to Jay. Suddenly, Jay calls out to them. She points to the entrance and says the entity just walked in. The friends get into position, but the entity doesn't fall for their trap. The entity now looks exactly like their dead father, and this has really unsettled Jay. Instead of getting into the water, the entity starts to walk around the pool towards the other end of the room. It picks up one of the appliances and throws it at Jay, not giving the young woman a chance to catch her breath. The entity starts throwing the other appliances at Jay. The appliances are all plugged in and cause a loud buzz each time from the electricity, each time they touch the water. Luckily, the friend's plan doesn't work, and Jay is not electrocuted. She tries to duck from the flying objects each time and swim away. But the entity just will not stop. Paul runs to get the gun from his bag. He asks Jay to point at the entity and keep her finger trained on it so they will know where it is at all times. He tries shooting it, but hits Yara in the leg instead. He shoots again and hits the entity in the hand, but this doesn't even slow it down. It throws an iron at Jay and connects with her head once again. Thinking quickly, her sister grabs a sheet and starts to wave it around where the entity is. After a few tries, she finally manages to throw it over the entity's head. This finally alerts Paul to where it is. He fires again and shoots it in the head. The entity falls into the pool, but it's still alive. Okay, these friends clearly hate Jay. This is the only possible explanation for why they forced her into the dumbest plan possible. They already know that the entity brushed off a shot in the neck like it was nothing. There's no reason to believe it can be hurt by any physical means. In fact, these jokers are so unprepared, they laid around for hours instead of preparing any way to make the entity visible. They didn't even take the gun out of its bag. Their plan was doomed from the start. While chlorinated pool water can conduct electricity, it's not the best conductor. At the very least, they they could have poured entire sacks of salt into the water to increase its conductivity. Plugging in all the appliances, turning them on, then leaving them at the edge of the water was also a terrible idea. Any one of these unevenly shaped objects could have fallen in and shocked Jay long before the entity arrives to finish her off. They should instead submerge all the appliances underwater, plug them in, but leave the master power switch off. This way, there's no risk of Jay getting shocked by accident, and they only need to flip one master switch on once the entity enters the pool, instead of having to run around the pool throwing hair dryers and toasters at it. The gun should also have been in the hands of the only person who can see the entity, Jay. Instead of having the poor woman tread in the freezing water all night, they should have searched the building for a table to throw in the center of the pool. That way, Jay can stand on the table and keep herself out of the water while having a higher vantage point to shoot at the entity from. This also cuts their trap activation time down from a dozen seconds to almost nothing. They can flip the switch the moment the entity enters with no risk to Jay, since no part of her body will be touching the water. This also allows her to keep her rubber shoes on to further insulate her from any current running beneath her. Jay starts swimming for the edge of the pool so her friends can pull her out, but it's too late. The entity catches up with her underneath the surface and drags her back, pulling her completely underwater. The young woman struggles helplessly, but it holds onto her leg and won't let go until she drowns. Seeing that she's in trouble, Paul starts to fire into the pool. He misses a few shots, then manages to shoot it in the head again. The entity lets go of Jay and she frantically swims to the surface. Her friends drag the exhausted young woman out of the pool. Looking back at the water, Jay cautiously approaches the edge and peers in. She sees a massive cloud of red spread through the water, as if the entity is infecting the entire pool. With the entity out of the picture of now, the friends return to the the suburbs. At Paul's house, Jay and Paul barricade themselves in his bedroom, where she finally agrees to sleep with him. Afterward, they agree that nothing feels any different. The next day, Paul drives into the bad part of town and catches the attention of some prostitutes. If the curse is still active, he intends to pass it on as soon as possible. At the hospital, the friends visit Yara. She's recovering well from getting shot, eating a sandwich, and reading to herself. Jay and Paul walk back home together, holding hands. They look exhausted and don't say a word to each other. As they walk, they don't notice that a harmless-looking figure is following close behind, and it's clear the entity is back for round two. But what do you think? How would you beat It Follows? Let me know with a comment down below. Thank you so much for watching. Give a like and subscribe. Check out the How To Be playlist for more videos like this. And don't forget that from now on, we'll be uploading on Wednesdays and Saturdays. Until next time, have a damn good day.